Hi guys, I'm Ebony Wilson, and in today's video, I'm going to be talking about the Leaving Neverland documentary and my personal thoughts on it as a fan of Michael Jackson, as a advocate of the Me Too movement, and as a filmmaker giving my personal understanding of filmmaking and storytelling of how the documentary was perceived. So if you're ready, let's go. So guys, we're talking today about the Leaving Neverland documentary, and all I really want to do is just give my personal thoughts on it as a filmmaker and as someone who, um, you, know, you know, I've never personally suffered from sexual abuse trauma, just a, a disclaimer out there, but I do have family members who have and very close friends of mine who have been uh, sexual abuse victims are physical abuse of, of kind, domestic violence. It has been in my family, unfortunately. Uh, first of all, the film was directed uh, by Dan Reed. I don't know any of Dan Reed's prior work. And one thing, the only thing really I really wanted to note about it is uh, from a filmmaker's perspective, that was told in the documentary style, of course, that way that many people are know. I have worked on documentary shows, uh, specifically shows in the similar uh, telling in which the finding, or excuse me, Leaving Neverland uh, was told, which um, if you've seen any shows like um, Murder Calls or um, the uh, crime mystery shows where they interview subjects or interview witnesses and then they give the retelling and the recounts of uh, of, of experiences and uh, of traumatic experiences and they just ask the witnesses to recount what happens. Basically what happens so the audience has a full picture is we invite those individuals in to sit down as Jake, as, excuse me, as Jim and Wade did in the documentary and there is a interviewer in the room across from them while they are being filmed and they are asking them questions that lead up to the happenings of what takes place, the bulk of the subject. And so the interviewer asks the subject to recount the events that led up to the circumstances. And that is what uh, Ray, Wade Robison and um, Jimmy Safechuck both did in this interview. So you, they, and they started both of them from a place of admiration, building up to how they met Michael, what their experiences was, was like when meeting Michael, and then ultimately what led up to them being invited um, to uh, Neverland and spending years in Michael's presence and allegedly uh, succumbing to sexual abuse that they themselves did not even know or claim to not know was sexual abuse. So one thing that I have noted uh, just uh, in my in my family and personal life dropping out of filmmaking side for just a second is what I'm seeing to be finding, I don't know if anyone has watched the Abducted in Plain Sight documentary, but it's a similar scenario where um, they talked about grooming in this, in the doc. They talked about how they were groomed and how for the longest time, on up until they claimed they were adults, that they did not even perceive that what was happening to them at the time was sexual abuse. They had no concept according to them that what they were experiencing was traumatic and was harmful. They were engrossed with the idea of being in Michael's presence. They were they were enamored by him so much that when it came time as they claimed to show their love for one another they thought that it was natural. The abducted in plain sight film kind of did something very similar where the perpetrator or the serial perpetrator in that documentary not only groomed the children but groomed the parents 
And so from that, tr so looking at it through that lens and looking at it through um, the lens of what can take place and how sexual assault, a lot of people think it's just, you know, it's a violent experience. And what they don't realize is sexual assault victims sometimes are groomed over a very long period of time by the perpetrators, by the people who are attacking them. That would explain why women, so many cases, I remember growing up and you read the tabloids and you see so many cases of women who were abducted and they went missing for years and years and years and when they were finally found, it would, you know, they, they were asked the question, why did you not escape or were you able to escape or and if you were why did you not escape and these women come back and say that they did not feel that they could or they had been groomed over so long a period of time that they felt that their circumstance was natural so in light of that I want to think that and, and in testimony and listening and me as a filmmaker having heard eyewitness testimonies of other individuals who have been interviewed in this similar style there's no question in my mind that Wade and James were both telling the truth they were telling the truth as it they remembered it and as um, how they felt because at no point in time either did they they put down really Michael Jackson they were enamored by him again they loved him and in Michael's way I know that I'm sure he loved them which is the kind of the the twisted the twisted mentality of it all is that not only were they the victims but Michael himself allegedly could have groomed himself to treat them in this way which is interesting to think about it's like the longer the the action persists the longer the the interaction persists it's like both parties then feel it becomes natural which is something that's very interesting i am no expert on psychology i just for the record i don't have any kind of doctorates or MBAs or degrees in psychology but I noticed through the accounts of these men a similar pattern and in the accounts of other stories that I've seen floating around there seems to be a pattern with the mental the mental state of what happens to these people when they are in these um, situations and both men had very similar stories and neither of them knew one another. They were both able to recount the same thing, though ne neither of them had met the other. Now, now let's look at this from the testimony or the side of why did these men wait so long? Or why were they not truthful from the beginning with their testimony? Wade Robson uh, in particular because he testified, I believe, twice according to the documentary, once in 93 and again in 2003 when the initial charges were brought against Michael Jackson for these alleged uh, sexual assault crimes. Wade claims that he did not, again, perceive that what had happened to him was sexual abuse, and so he felt it was his obligation to defend Michael that is arguable and debatable and I can't address all of that in one go but what I will say about this and giving light to MJ for just a second as as an admirer of MJ's work myself um, an admirer of the man that a lot of these allegations do not seem in line again with the man and so I want to hear both sides of the issue Okay, I can appreciate that the documentary just decided to explore the um, explore the background of these men just as a single piece in itself, but to the public, which because this has such an impact on the rest of the world, it appears unfair, it appears unjust to accuse a dead man 
who can no longer defend himself of allegations and to tarnish his name and trash his name once again sling him through the mud because these men decided to wait to tell the truth that is something that I don't think the public is going to accept and it's something that even I don't accept as um, as someone, as, as just a person, as a lover of MJ. And I mentioned at the beginning of this video that I have family members who have suffered from sexual assault and violence in my, in my life. Um, and I can say that even those family members, again, this is so hard because these family members withheld information for a long time. They didn't know if they would be believed, not even by their closest family. So there's this truthfulness that I know is true in these men. And if you are a child, and you have no idea that what is happening to you is abuse and you are groomed over such a long time to think one thing and then you are finally an adult and you realize that everything you have been taught or groomed to believe has been a lie, then I can understand the emotional frustration, the intellectual... How, like, how can they live and hold that in? They can't. But at the same time, here, ultimately, here's what I think is going to happen. I don't think that Wade Robison or James Safechuck, Jimmy Safechuck, can expect to get any monetary restitution from the Jackson estate for what they claim allegedly happened to them. I don't think that will come to fruition. And I say that because it's almost like that is the price that they have to pay. If what they're saying is true, then that's almost the price that they have to pay. I don't even know if that's the right word, but you get where I'm coming from. That they now have the opportunity to heal from the experience by sharing their story and reaching other survivors of sexual assault or domestic assault and abuse. But because they waited and because they are now grown men who know, I don't think they can rationally or legally otherwise gain anything from this except, except to heal. That is my opinion, the, the best that they can do. Um, and to share their message with the world. And it's up to you to interpret and decide, determine for, your, for yourself if you believe the testimony of these two men. I am just presenting my perspective, kind of trying to be unbiased um, in both areas. Um, it may feel like I've kind of leaned one way or the other. And maybe I have, I don't know. Here's the, tr here's the facts. We know Michael was acquitted. He was not found guilty on any charges of sexual assault by, in both uh, trials that we know of, right? He was not found guilty. These men even came to his defense, at least one of them did, or the, both of them did, one in written testimony and the other in actual physical uh, testimony. And they denied these allegations against Michael. Sorry, that's going to hold against them, as it probably should. Okay? That's the price you pay, in my opinion. On the second side, after hearing the documentary and listening to the testimony of these men, it is understandable to me as a viewer how they could have been groomed, how they could even perceive that what happened to them was normal at the time, and how it has affected them now as adults. So. If there's a little background noise, I'm sorry. There's just probably a bunch going on in my house right now. <laughs> but you guys can hear me. Um, but that's my perspective. I believe them. 
But at the same time, I'm not ready to condemn Michael. From a personal, as a, from a personal standpoint, and uh, as an artist standpoint. However, I will say that, and I think D.L. Hughley made the point that you can still love the artist, but maybe you can't love the man. I can still love Michael's music and what he contributed to the world and how, yes, he was in my life. He was in my little brother's life. He, my, my little brother did student talent shows to Michael's music and he was a big fan and I uh, love Michael. Who doesn't love Michael, okay? He's a part of our world, whether we like it or not. We have all experienced him in some form, some way, and he has touched us. And I don't know if that was too literal or too pun intended. It is not pun intended. Anyway, <laughs> I digress. Um, I encourage you to watch the documentary. If you have not watched the documentary, I don't think you can properly make up your, your mind about what really happened. I think you need to watch it. You need to watch it and you need to hear these men. Because if they are telling the truth, then it's important in this era of Me Too that we hear abuse, that we hear victims of sexual abuse and understand the process, understand what's going on in the, in the minds of people who suffer trauma like this. And it's also important that we get, that we try to find some restitution or retribution in all of this for the sake of these men and for the sake of Michael. Because it's his name, his legacy that ultimately goes down. I won't say it goes down, but clearly, I mean, it's going down. You know, shows or stations, uh, uh, big studios are pulling his music. They're not airing Michael's music. We've never had that happen. So there are real life ramifications of this documentary being out there and we can't ignore that. Okay. So just make up your own minds, everyone. I'm trying to stay as open as possible. Just make up your own mind when you listen, when you hear. And, um, you know, don't be quick to rush. I know everyone wants to believe in MJ. Even I want to believe in MJ. And I do. I'm not going to, let me state this for the record, I'm not going to condemn MJ when he cannot be here publicly to defend himself. He's The man is dead. He cannot defend himself. And there's no way that we can ever really know what happened at this point. So I'm not ready to condemn Michael for these men who waited to tell their story. But at the same time, I am looking at this through the era of Me Too, which is that victims, real victims, wait. And there's no explanation for why they wait because it has to be an individual choice of when they come out and when they're finally ready to tell their story. And I have to be ready to believe them when that happens. Guys, those are my final thoughts. I Please leave me know. Let's have a discussion. Leave your thoughts and comments in the comment section below. Click that like button if this video brought you any value or if you just enjoyed hearing this perspective um, or want to just continue the discussion. I'm happy to discuss. If you want to hear from more, click the subscribe button as well. You know, I just got to put a plug in there trying to grow my own YouTube channel guys so I appreciate the support and I appreciate you guys sticking through this video on leaving Neverland my personal perspective thanks again guys we'll see you in the next one